If you have your Bible, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 1, and in your pew Bibles, that is 802. 802 in your pew Bible. Matthew, chapter 5, we'll start with verse 1. Matthew 5, 1 says, One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Verse 3. God blesses those who are poor. Just a little um, sidebar here. You're, you're most likely remembering this to say, blessed are the poor. But God, it's, it's literally God blesses those who are in poor spirit, actually, literally. God blesses those who are of poor spirit and realize their need for Him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness. For they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Verse 9. God blesses those who work for peace, or the peacemakers. For they will be called the children of God. Verse 10. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in this same way. All right, you think about that. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. <clears throat> but I would like to uh, bring my rod and staff here so I get your full attention. I'm going to talk a little bit about shepherding. Is that okay? Pay attention. Ken, where are you at? Ken, can you pay attention? Okay, good. I have your attention. I want to tell you a story. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I have a stick now. Be careful. All right. Once upon a time, ladies and gentlemen, there was a guy who was a shepherd. He grew up in the hill country. His dad, his grandpa, everybody before him were shepherds. All they did was raise sheep. And the way they made their money was during shearing season, they took those old sheep got them sheared, and they weighed, and they did the stuff with the wool, and they made their money that way. But that was one day. All the rest of the time, they were out there trying to look after these sheep. It was a hard job. And this fella, it's all he ever knew. And uh, right over the hill from where he lived, there was a church. And he, he knew it was there, but he never, ever went to church. He was usually out in the fields doing something, or on his weekends off, he'd go to town and do naughty stuff. But he never went to the church. Right? One Sunday morning, he was out there in the field. He looked around and there was, there was help. There was hired people. So he thought, you know what? I'm just going to visit that church. I've never been there. I'm going to go sit and, and, and just see what they're about. So the shepherd puts on his Sunday best. What's the shepherd's Sunday best? I don't know. He goes down to the church and he sits in the back. So he's not you know, being conspicuous. And uh, the preacher starts. <clears throat> Talking about, my sheep know my voice, and we are the sheep of God, and we're, you know, sheepy, all this blah, blah, blah. And the guy couldn't help. He started snickering. And the preacher's trying to do his message, and every time he, every time he tried to make a point, the guy in the back would snicker. <laughs> How would you like to preach that when somebody's snickering? You wouldn't want that. So finally it got overwhelming. And the preacher says, excuse me, sir, why are you back there snickering while I'm preaching my message? And the guy looked around and says, all right, preacher, I'll tell you why. You're up there talking about sheep, 
right? And you're calling these people sheep. He says, well, I happen to know firsthand that sheep are about the dumbest thing that ever walked on planet Earth. And you're calling your people sheep. And they're just sitting here, boo, listening to you. Do you know that sheep are so stinking dumb, they would just walk off a cliff unless you're there to stop them. They might drown because they don't know enough. They can't swim. And they, you know, they're pretty much got that wool coat. They sink to the bottom. They drown. You got to watch them. You know, all the time. And they'll just go off and eat poison grass. They don't know. They think wild grass is good. And you, you got to <coughs> stick your finger down their throat and induce vomiting just to save their lives. Because they're so dumb. And you're calling your people here dumb. And, uh, you know, uh, what's the other thing? They will wander off. And... Even if a raccoon oh, comes out of the wild, they have a heart attack and die right there because they're so dumb and they're afraid of everything. I mean, one starts running, the other one's run. Why? I don't know. He ran, so I ran. I mean, sheep are about the dumbest thing on planet Earth. And you're standing up there calling people your sheep. And the guy gets up and he walks out. So let me ask you this. Would you be insulted, any of you, if I called you a bunch of dumb sheep? A few of you, or you can't hide your face. You've already made your face. I read it. Yes, you would be sheep. Well, let me ask you this question, my sheep. Don't, don't look at me like that. I got the stick. So, um, if, are any of you about to just wander off? You know, the, the sheep, the shepherd works really hard to keep you guys in line, to keep you guys together, to make sure you're fed and water. He, he really has to watch you guys all the time. Any of you tempted to just wander off? and maybe fall off a cliff. Now if I run up there and say, hey, Daisy, Lazy, Maisie, whatever you get away from that cliff, you're gonna fall. Would you look at me and say, yeah, the shepherd always tell me what to do. I'm trying to save your life, right? The shepherd doesn't get any kind of, oh, thank you. No, just, nah, they get grumbling, and they come back, right? Are any of you ready to fall off a cliff? Alice says no, good, glad to hear that. Uh, are any of you over your head, you're about ready to drown? Any of you? Well, if I ran in there and I saved your life, would you, when you look at me and say, you're judging me, you're too harsh. I knew what I was doing. I was in complete control. You had to insinuate yourself into my life. Who do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. Any of you feel like that? Why is he always telling us what to do? Saving your life. Don't want you to drown. You know, that's not talking about me necessarily. That's the Lord coming into your life. He's the chief shepherd. All right, let me ask you this. Have you ever wandered off and ate the strange grass. Ooh, it looks so good. He's given us the boring grass all the time. We eat from this field, and then we eat from that field. What about that wild grass over there? If I could just squeeze through the fence and go over there and eat some wild grass, oh, that'd be so cool. Any of you, any of you want to go out and eat some wild grass, you better not. Because I'm not about ready to put my stick down your throat and induce vomiting. Save your life. Pump your stomach. Breathe on you. Breathe. I don't want to do that. So, any of you feel that way? Stop telling me what to do. I can handle it. I'm tired of your boring grass. It happens all the time. And uh, how do you feel about uh, the, the wild beasts and the animals? You know, a sheep is about the most vulnerable thing. You know, they don't have defense mechanisms. Sheep do not have claws. Sheep don't have... Vicious teeth, you know. They're pretty much lunch on four legs. Or a late night dinner or snack, right? They cannot defend themselves. The shepherd has to look out for them or they're going to get eaten, right? They have to keep up. If they wander back or they wander off, there's a good chance that they're going to get eaten, right? If you're lagging behind, the Lord will bump, bump. Or he has, there's that one with the big, crook on it, the shepherd's crook, just put it around Daisy's neck and dragging her along. Oh, why are you always dragging me? Why are you always, to save your life. That's what shepherds do for the sheep. Now you still feel bad about being a sheep? Because anybody in this room know how to nod their heads. Yes. Anybody out there? No, Ken, thank you. At least you're honest. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. So, Jesus comes on the scene in his earthly ministry. Now, all these people in Israel have heard the Old Testament quoted. That, well, that's all they had. There was no New Testament back then. 
And they heard the rabbis say this. And they've heard the temple priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees say this. And they've heard it and they've heard it and they've heard it. And now a long-haired preacher from Nazareth comes on the scene and he gives new life to it. He brings out the Bible, the Old Testament, like they'd never heard before. He makes it alive. He gets their attention and hundreds and hundreds and then thousands of thousands want to come hear him talk because they never heard it. And he's getting them excited about God again. I mean, it was like, oh yeah, you go, you go to synagogue, yeah, you hear your thing, you, sit, you stand here, you do this, you bow, you do you eat this. And it just, it's what you do, right? We're a Jew, this is what we do. So, and then Jesus comes on the scene. And in this instance where Jesus sits up like on a hillside, a mountainside, and he's talking to them. He's bringing out truths, and he goes on. I just read you a little bit of Matthew 5. He goes on in 6 and the 7, and he's blowing their minds with this whole new perspective of what God's about. And it's not necessarily a new perspective. It's exactly what the law and the prophets had been meaning all along. But they never saw it in action before. I mean, as nice as those priests and, and, and rabbis, and the, the, you know, as nice as they may have been, they just didn't have it all together. They were giving it all they had, but now the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is in flesh among them. And he's saying something that blows their mind. If you had never heard these words before, right? And he said this to you. I think we have mice. Do you hear them down there? I need to send a big cat. They may bring a big cat. To come. Anyway, there's kids. That's the sound of growth, what you're hearing, right? Every time there's a kid running around, just want to take a little side jaunt. Do you mind if I take a little side jaunt? You know, we talk about sheep being so dumb. Please don't take me the wrong way and hear me out here. About the dumbest thing on planet Earth is a baby. <laughs> Sorry, you want to throw tomatoes at me? Listen to me here. They poop everywhere. They throw up all the time. And they slobber on all your stuff. And they, they don't communicate. And they're all about them. Oh, I need this. I want, I'm hungry. I need change. And they're just outrageous. And they can't walk. They need everything in the world done for them because they can't do nothing. What's up with that? But we look at them and they're so darn cute. And we love them. And we would do anything. We would die for them. And we would give everything we own to, to make them comfortable and to meet their needs. And we go without sleep. Remember this part. <laughs> you go without sleep when they're babies. And then they grow up to be 18, 9 years old. And you still don't get any sleep because you're up worrying about them. It's like they're consuming. They take stuff for you. But the only reason you give them the time of day is because you absolutely love them. They are so cute. And if they weren't cute, God made them cute. That's a survival tactic, okay? <laughs> and, you know, and you, want to, you want to bring that back? Children of God, right? You might not think you're all that special. You may not think, eh, it's better than me, whatnot. But God seriously thinks you guys are so darn cute. He loves you so much. He has intervened into your life. God personally has seen to it that you did not fall off a cliff. God knows when you've gone out and you've got a bellyache because you were nibbling on some bad grass. God has come to, into your world. He's come into your life through your friends or through a pastor or through whoever or through a billboard that speaks to you. And he's warned you and he's talked to you and he's brought out stuff to you. Why? He loves you. Absolutely loves you. God has a habit of going after sinners you know, all the people that God has called over the years, there's not many wise, not many noble. Most of the greatest preachers, teachers, evangelists, apostles were the most unlikely people. Not your grade A prime people at all. I know, said the Lord, I will call a foul-mouthed fisherman to be one of my chief disciples. Would you have done that? I know the most hated guy in town, the tax collector. Everybody love the tax collector? Not so much. Your cousin worked for the IRS. He's not going to get a date. <laughs> anyway, he calls Matthew the tax collector. He calls the, the zealot. Ugh. 
You know, he's out to, for blood. He's a dangerous person. He makes you nervous. I'll have one of those. And he goes through and he picks these 12 motley crew, guys. Motley crew. And, you know, of course, you know how that worked out. And down the road, the person who single-handedly hated the church more than any living person, and he was about ready to jail them or have them killed or have them whatever, he was going after them. He was in the process of chasing down Christians. And God says, oh, I'll have one of those. The Apostle Paul knocks him down, flat in his face, speaks to him. And the, the coolest thing, he says to the Apostle Paul, who was Saul then, <clears throat> stop persecuting me, or why are you persecuting me? What you talking about? I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting these people. This is the intimate part. When you touch one of God's children, you've got to mess with the horns. <laughs> right? You mess with the bull, you get the horns. Right? Is that how is that? You, if anybody's messing with God's people, God absolutely has your back. He is your defense. So ultimately, justice will come. Justice, and he said, I got this. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Oh, you just step out of the way. Let me take care of this. This is our faithful, loving God. He is the real shepherd. He is the one who loves you. You made a mistake, man. You got off on some weird stuff. You, 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 you started faltering and fumbling and, and, and just feeling disconnected. He leaves the 99 to go after you. Why? I don't deserve it. I absolutely do not deserve this. You know how evil I've been, Tom? Do you know how stupid, how I've been a betrayer, I've been a liar? Yeah, I know. I've been one too. <laughs> he loves you. He goes after. He seeks and saves the lost. That's why I'm standing here. And a lot of Christians, they've been going through the motions. They've been doing this and that. They've been doing what they were taught to do. Stand, yield, yield. You know, spin in a circle, whatever they're telling you to do. Read this passage. And, and sometimes you go to some churches and they're reading scriptures and it's so dead and so dry. Well, sometimes God, I don't know, God messes with you. <laughs> he will reach down and he'll stir up the most unlikely people and he will give life to them. He will cause revival. He's done it all through history. Now, there's a lot of talk about what revival is and what it isn't. The, the simplest way and the best way uh, I can think of revival is, okay, you're laying on the table and there's no pulse. And they've done the, <laughs> and there's no pulse. And the doctor walks in and says, clear! <laughs> Didn't work? One more time. <laughs> Third time. <gasps> hey, you're not dead. You've revived. You were close to being dead, but now you're living because someone intervened Someone put the juice to you, and you are revived. Or someone who's uh, went in the deep water, and, and their heart's not beating, and, and they do the, the, the pulmonary stuff, and the, the water comes out, and they start breathing again. They've been revived. For years, not just me, not just you, I'd say millions of people around the country have been praying for a rebirth in the church of God in the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus talked to the church in the book of Revelation, the first three chapters. He told them, hey, you lost your first love. Hey, you're letting stuff into your church that should not be there. Hey, you've, you've gone cold. Hey, your religion is dead and worthless. And Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold. You know, I could spew you out of my mouth, but I want you to get it together. I want you to get it right. He warns the church first. Before any of those things in Revelation happen, he addresses the church first. And I firmly believe, and I know a lot of you believe this, the first thing God's going to do before he starts dealing real serious judgment with America is he's going to wake up the church. He's going to speak to us first. I believe that. And as God does... He uses the most unlikely characters. People you had never thought. And they're wild, and they spit all over the place, and they poop, and they, they, they slobber over everything. And, you know, and they're like, oh gosh, couldn't you have called some noble people? Couldn't you have talked to somebody with a PhD or somebody who was a you know, doctor of theology or what? Couldn't you? No. God is talking to a bunch of college kids. 
smelly, wild, crazy college kids, you know? And you know, they make mistakes, man. They're not, they don't have it all together. They need disciples. They need the, the right scriptures. They need to get things together. But right now, God is speaking to them. He's calling them, not just in Kentucky, all over the world this is happening. God is moving. God is answering our prayers. I believe this so firmly. Now there's some fire and there's some wildfire. Wildfire is bad. You don't want to feed that. But the fire of God, wow, you've got got to appreciate that. Now as an apologist, we want to point out, hey, the scripture says, watch out for that. The scriptures say, don't do that. And the people who pick and choose scripture like, well, we like this part, but we don't like that part, so we'll get rid of that part and we'll just concentrate on that. The apologist's job is to come in and say, no, the, the uh, scriptures say this, the whole counsel of God says this, that's important. But when God is starting a fire, let's just see what happens. Because when the Holy Spirit comes on a person or near a person in that kind of intensity like it's happening these days, Jesus told us, This is what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts you of sin. He reproves you righteousness. You know, he teaches you. He guides you. He comforts you, right? And he will show you things to come. This is the gift. This is the Holy Spirit talking to his church, right? And and a lot of these young kids, they're feeling hunger for God. They're, 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 They're honestly, I love Their honesty. I've heard many testimonies of what's been happening in our country. I've actually talked to people who were there. I talked to them personally. You know, I've heard many reports. I've heard some weird stuff happening. You know, wildfire, you know. And I've heard some over-emotional things. And I've heard some genuine, broken-hearted repentance things. And, uh, you know, it's a... a, When when you start dealing with, with people who are the most unlikely, there's fire and there's wildfire. And our job, ladies and gentlemen, you mature believers, be an example. Be loving. Be patient with them. Let's let's learn how to disciple them. What what did Jesus say when he was starting the church? Tell them my word. Go to them. Tell them my word. Make them repent. And then start discipling them. Baptize them. Teach them my teachings. What what happened in in, in Acts chapter 2? The church was born that day of Pentecost. And they sat and they learned the apostles' teaching. They shared with one another. They learned, they grew, they prayed for one another. And the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, not the board, (laughs) the Lord, added to the church daily. If we love him, if we turn from our wicked ways, if we go towards righteousness, God will visit us there. I found a couple scriptures this week that I haven't really thought about lately. In Romans 3, it tells us, I'm sorry, no, this is actually Romans 2, 4. I think I corrected that. The goodness of God leads to repentance. The goodness of God. Sometimes God shows up and he shows you such love and some mer- such mercy that you're just overwhelmed by the goodness of God. And you say, oh, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? Lord, forgive me. I think of Isaiah when he we stood in the presence of God. He said, I'm undone. I shouldn't be here. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in a land of people of unclean lips. And the angel took the coal and, and touched his lips, and he was purged. And, and then God says, who will go for us? And Isaiah, bless his heart, he says, here am I, send me. You know, we all come from weird places, but I'm I'm saying when the goodness of God, when we see the goodness of God, it it convicts us of our sins. It it, it helps us seek his righteousness. And when we get to the point where we can say, here am I, Lord, send me. I'm seeing a lot of college kids doing that these last couple weeks. Not all of them, but a lot of them. They're saying the goodness of God has led us to repentance. And we love him. What can we do for you, sir? I was angry. I was a pornographer. I was bitter. I was so sinful. I was a drinker and a drug pole. I was into lifestyles that were wrong. And I see this goodness of God coming in our college and I see all these things happening and I'm so sorry for my sins. And they kneel at that altar and they're, they're, they're asking for prayer. 
It's awesome. But there's another scripture too that came to my remembrance this past week. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Ever heard that one before? What causes godly sorrow? Oh, by the way, that is in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. What is godly sorrow? It's, I think it's literally this. Being in the presence of God and being undone. It's overwhelmed by his goodness and overwhelmed by your badness. <laughs> When the Spirit of God comes on you, that's one of the things Jesus said the Spirit does. He convicts you of sin. He does. We go out and we give the gospel to people, right? We've done our job. We planted. The Holy Spirit takes it from there. He's the one that convicts people of their sins. I'm living proof of that. I heard the gospel when I was 15 or 16. It cut me to the quick. And I, my decision was a bad one. I started running away from it. And I couldn't outrun God. He was chasing me. And then he played a dirty trick on me. He saved my beautiful girlfriend. Then she invited me to church. <sighs> and then I said, no, I'm not going. No, I'm not. Yes, I'll go. You're so pretty. I got to go. <laughs> and uh, here I am. God sought me in the midst of my sin. He convicted me of my sins. He brought me to the foot of the cross. I gave it all. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Sometimes God just has to break you down. Sometimes he's just got to break your heart. I'm seeing that too. Not all the time, but I'm seeing an awful lot of it. These, these kids, these teenagers are seeing, oh gosh, I got to get out of this stuff. I got I to gotta stop doing this. I don't know how to stop doing it, Lord. How do I do this? What, how can I make you happy? How can I give you everything? He's saying, to them, like he's told us this morning, I surrender half. I surrender a smidge. Just a smidge I give to Jesus. And I live like the devil the rest of the week. Ta da! Right? Duh, that's what we sing sometimes. No, friends, you know how it goes. I surrender all. That's what God wants. He will pick you up. He will wash you up. He will get you in a place where you can be discipled, where you can grow. He will put you in a position where your light will so shine that people will see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So this move of God, this awakening, or this revival, however you want to categorize it, it's got its problems. There's some snares. There's some people who aren't very sincere. There's some people who are just emotional. There's some people who don't want to give up their stuff. And then there's some who give up everything. And they say, Lord, here I am. What can I do for you? That is what I'm counting on. That's what I'm praying for. That's what I want to see for America. Is God speaking to America in these last days? Is he trying to get us in order? Would God use the most unlikely people, smelly teenagers and college students? Who would have thunk it? I believe he is. And I'm praying for them. Uh, one of the things uh, that, that has been going around is, if you believe God is working in this way, adopt a college. Uh, find a college in your neighborhood. For me, I'm looking at Geneva College. And pray for those students to come alive. Those students down there in Geneva, they run the gamut. Some of them are just there to get the thing and they don't really care about Jesus too much. Some are there with the sweetest hearts who love the Lord, who just want to grow and be educated, and you have everybody in between. They're just, you know, this Generation Z that they're calling Gen Z. Uh, I, I talked a little bit about this last week. They've seen pain. There's so much fr frustration. There's so much anger. There's so much... Uh, in their lives that they're going through. When the Lord comes to them, their hearts are crying out. I'm seeing it. Too many, a lot, not too many. A lot of them are saying, where you been, Lord? We never heard this. We never heard it spoken like this before, like Jesus talking to the, the people on the mount. We've never heard somebody break it down like this. Lord, come. Your goodness leads me to repentance. And, and sometimes your heaviness leads me to repentance. But Lord, I don't want to be this anymore. I want to live for you. I want to be like you. God hears that prayer and he answers it. In closing, 
this week, got to go see the Jesus Revolution. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, it's in theaters right now. It's a story of the Great Awakening, the revival that happened in 1970. There was a preacher named Chuck Smith, and he had a congregation that was, eh, and a bunch of smelly, dirty hippies, the last people you'd expect, the last people you'd want to come into your church wearing bell bottoms, hadn't taken a bath in a while, their dirty feet, they're messing up the carpet, and Chuck Smith invites them in. Some people left and some stayed. And it grew and it grew and it grew until they was in a big tent. And they went down to Pirate's Cove in, in California there right on the beach side. And they baptized thousands of people. And they were kids. The disenfranchised, disillusioned teenagers and college age students of the 1970s. Coming through the summer of love. And how many people died of bad trips and, and, and LSD and suicides and now they're coming through to say what do we do nothing's working the drugs don't work the free sex don't work all these things what do we need and Jesus moved there and there was an enormous revival among the most least likely people that God says I'll take them Thousands of them, thousands. Then it moved to Texas, it moved up to the Northwest, and it moved everywhere. The great Jesus movement of 1970. Do you know what else happened in 1970? Gosh, I could just take you all day here. 1970, February 3rd. A bunch of teenagers, college-age students, were in Hughes Chapel, in Kentucky at Asbury University. And they, this is true, look me up. They stayed by the altar and they stayed by the altar and they prayed for America. They prayed for themselves, their families. They laid it all and the Spirit of God came and they didn't have social media. They, didn't have, they couldn't text anybody. But people in the dorm started coming and people from other college campuses came and people in town came and they had thousands of people in Hughes Auditorium, 1970, February. Look it. Look it up. It happened. And those students were encouraged to go to colleges all over America in 1970 and tell how the Lord fell there, to, to tell how they met the Lord, to tell how they repented, to tell them the gospel. And there was a great revival. West Coast, all the hippies were getting saved. In, in the mid to East Coast, that story of Asheville, Tennessee... Ashburg, Ashbury, sorry. Ashbury, Tennessee, Asbury. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I have this, this chewing way of talking. I said Tennessee? Well, in Lee, Tennessee, they're doing that, right? Did I get that right? No, Leesburg, Tennessee. You see, we could have an argument here, but remember, guys, I got this big stick. So next time I say something, just say, Thank you. He's so close to Mr. Know-it-all, it's starting to rub off. <laughs> Didn't I say I was closing? <laughs> All right, I'm going to put down my weapon. <laughs> he did it before, and he's doing it again. America is on the ropes. There's political blah 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 There's world problems. There's environmental disasters not too far away from us. There's a division in our country like never before. In the 70s, it was bad. We had Vietnam going on. We had all these, these terrible things going on. The government was falling apart. They were this close to Watergate <laughs> back in 1970. I mean, there was no trust. They, they killed uh, two Kennedy brothers. They killed Martin Luther King. Uh, the summer love came and went. And all these college age students like, where are you? What's going on? We don't understand this. And the gospel hit them like a ton of bricks. And they were giving their hearts to Jesus in droves in Kentucky and on the West Coast. We're seeing it again. Because their story came out this week. Jesus Revolution. It's the story of the Great Revival of 1970. And coincidentally, do you believe in those? Ashbury College in, in, in Kentucky having another Revival, having another awakening. And all of America is going there and talking about it. There's people from Chile who've gone up there, South America. And there's people from 
Uh, the, oh my gosh, I, I could just lose it here from everywhere who have come there. And people have gotten saved, people have gotten healed and delivered like crazy. And it is spreading. Now, it's probably all wrapping up down there. And, you know, that's God's pleasure to do so. But expect it, guys, to be in your hometown. I'm praying for Geneva College. I want it to happen there. And Slippy Rock up there. And Clarion up there. And IUP down that way. Is it that way? And what other colleges we got? Westminster. Westminster. Let's just pray the Holy Spirit fall on them. And that the goodness of God would lead to repentance. And that godly sorrow would lead them to repentance. But it'd be the work of the Holy Spirit in truth, according to the scriptures. None of this crazy nonsense, according to the gospel that the Lord Jesus gave us. Can anybody say amen to that? So, what's our part in all this? Let's pray. Let's get our hearts right. Let's re-examine ourselves. And let's get ready for one more move of God. One more outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Like he said in Joel, and again in James, the former and the latter rain. The soaking rain before the harvest that all the farmers pray for. Let's pray that for the United States of America. Because we know political solutions aren't happening. It's the Lord God Almighty who reigns. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is our solution. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you with a whole heart. You are so awesome and so great. We see your work and we say amen. And we say, Lord, here we are. Let us be a help. Let us spread the word. Let us seek you. Let us seek the scriptures. Let us be led and guided by your Holy Spirit. May we feed your fire and not the strange, weird fire. May we represent the risen Christ in truth in these days. We commit it all to you. And we pray for these college students, for high school students all over America and into the world that you would wake them up and shake them up and disciple them and baptize them and teach them and that they would be the next revolution for Jesus in this world. Lord, do all this for your glory. Do all this. Have mercy on the sinners. Have mercy on the lost in these days. We are going to trust you. We're not going to trust CNN or MSNBC or even Fox or anybody else. We're going to trust you, God. You do your work in these days. And we will say amen and amen. In Jesus' name.